Hello, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the Academic Director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. We are continuing our reading of The Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt, and we are in Chapter 12, the penultimate chapter. Uh, this chapter, called Totalitarianism in Power, was actually the final chapter of the first edition of the book, uh, followed by a short epilogue, but uh, later uh, the book acquired a 13th chapter on ideology and terror. In this chapter, uh, RN moves from asking about totalitarian movements and uh, the organization of totalitarianism to, say, to asking how is it that a totalitarian movement can continue to exist once it's in power. Now, we have to remind ourselves that totalitarian movements are movements, imperialist, seeking world domination. And she says on page 392 that, quote, the struggle for total domination of the total population of the earth, the elimination of every competing non-totalitarian reality is inherent in the totalitarian regimes themselves. So all totalitarian regimes seek to actualize what the totalitarian movement seeks, which is world domination, total domination. And yet, this leads to a paradox. And the paradox she explores on page 391 is actually quite simple. On the one hand, uh, this new totalitarianism in power must seek total domination. It must seek to control the world, and thus the institution of a reality that eliminates all competing non-totalitarian realities. On the other hand, um, it can't allow this new fiction, this new reality, to develop into a new form of stability um, because the stabilization of this new reality and its laws and institutions would liquidate the movement itself, would take the totalitarian movement and make it stable. And the very premise of the totalitarian movement is that it must continue to move uh, it demands a, what she calls a permanent instability within a fictitious world of movement. And this is a paradoxical solution. And so, uh, for example, the Nazis at every stage need to increase their uh, ideological uh, demands, the fictional demands of their world, in order to continue to mobilize their people the Nazis, uh, in, in, in pursuit of, 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 their, uh, of their world domination. So, for example, they first uh, attacked full Jews, then half Jews, then quarter Jews, then the insane, then the sick. And this moving target uh, is an absolute necessity for all totalitarian regimes. On page 391, Arendt uh, describes the place of the totalitarian leader within this totalitarian regime in a way that uh, I think is, is deeply meaningful. She writes, totalitarian leaders, quote, prevent this new world from developing a new stability. For a stabilization of its laws and institutions would surely liquidate the movement and with it the hope for eventual world conquest. The totalitarian ruler must at any price prevent normalization from reaching the point where a new life, a new way of life, could develop, one which might, after a time, lose its bastard qualities and take its place among the widely differing and profoundly contrasting ways of life of the nations of the earth. The moment the revolutionary institutions become a national way of life, totalitarianism would lose its total quality and become subject to the law of nations, according to which each possesses a specific territory, people, and historical tradition, which relates it to other nations. A plurality which, ipso facto, refutes every contention that any specific form of government is absolutely valid. And so uh, the idea here is that the leader must prevent the totalitarian this movement that's in power from ever becoming a normal 
way of life, the ever becoming institutionalized as just another form of life among many. Uh, it must in some way always keep its total quality, its movement, um, and its permanent instability. And this is the paradox of totalitarianism and power. And the chapter is in three parts. The first part is called the so-called totalitarian state. And it explores how totalitarianism and power never actually becomes a state, never actually takes over the state, how it always is so-called and it, because it can't become stable. And uh, there are a number of ways it does this, but one is that it, uh, it always insists that the state is not structured and that it uses this process called duplication. So it passes laws, but it ignores the laws. The laws are there and they are propaganda tools in many ways. They can be used and employed sometimes, but they can also be ignored. Uh, there's a duplication of all the administration so that there's a party bureaucracy that's higher than the state bureaucracy. And thus, uh, it can be, and then there's also an apparatus that can be used to neutralize both the party and the state. And these overlapping bureaucracies allow the leader to constantly play one off the other. Um, the more visible a government agency is in a totalitarian state, the less power it actually has. Real power is secret, as RN says on page 403. Uh, there's no hierarchy. And this is important because a hierarchy actually institutes authority and certain people have authority over others and they create powers that could intervene and limit the power of the leader and thus the direction of the totalitarian movement. But on the contrary, what totalitarian organizations in power do is uh, decimate all power structures all places where authority might exist separate from the leader of the party. And this leads, she writes on page 407, to the full atomization of the masses. Uh, not only of the masses, though, but also of the top bureaucrats and functionaries of the party. The point is that in a totalitarian government, nobody can be trusted except the leader. And there's constant shifts in power that the leader directs, that destroy all authorities, all reliabilities, and all relationships, and all cliques. And so this raises a question. If this is the case, why doesn't the state, the totalitarian state, crack? Why is it not so unstable, unstable, that it would uh, disappear? And her answer is that totalitarian states are not actually concerned with calculable, stable outcomes. Uh, they're not actually concerned with the well-being of the people. They're actually instead concerned with what she calls a new concept of power on page 417, a new and unprecedented concept of power. And on 417 to 418, she writes, quote, Supreme disregard for immediate consequences rather than ruthlessness. Rootlessness and neglect of national interests rather than nationalism contempt for utilitarian motives rather than unconsidered pursuit of self-interest, idealism, that is their unwavering faith in, in an ideological, fictitious world rather than lust for power. And this new idea of power, which is not utilitarian, not about welfare, but is simply about an unwavering faith in an ideological and fictitious world, is... Uh, how totalitarian organizations operate in power. And on 411 to 412, she writes, Our bewilderment about the anti-utilitarian character of the totalitarian state structure springs from a mistaken notion that we are dealing with a normal state after all, a bureaucracy, a tyranny, a dictatorship. From our overlooking the emphatic assertions by totalitarian rulers, that they consider the country where they happen to seize power only the temporary headquarters of the international movement on the road to world conquest. That they reckon victories and defeats in terms of centuries or millennia 
and that the global interests always overrule the local interests of our own territory. What strikes the outside observer as a piece of prodigious insanity is nothing but the consequence of the absolute primacy of the movement, not only over the state, but also over the nation, the people, and the positions of power held by the rulers themselves. And so this so-called totalitarian state is one of absolute abnormality. And all normalities, all stabilities, all regularities need to be upended. And so it's shocking to see a totalitarian leader simply attacking all institutions and saying things that nobody can believe and acting as if they are completely unreliable and outside of reality. And yet it's precisely that attack on normality and rationality and reason that makes the totalitarian ruler powerful insofar as he focuses not on the normal activities of politics, but on the creation of a fictional and a maintenance of a fictional world that they continue to hammer upon and say, this is what's real, this is what's true, even counter to reality. And the brilliance of a totalitarian ruler, if we are able to speak of brilliance, is to continue to focus on that reality, that fictional reality, at the expense of all other reality. Part two of chapter 12 is on the secret police. And the secret police is one of the essential uh, events of totalitarianism and power. What is the role of the secret police? Well, it's not what we might think is obvious, which is to deal with the opposition. Um, she says, in the first stages of totalitarian rule, that is an object of the police, but the secret police that emerges in full totalitarianism emerges at a time when the opposition is largely neutralized, if not completely disappeared, and all opposition is gone. And it's at that point that the secret police becomes the center of totalitarian rule, totalitarianism in power, and the true aim and the role of the secret police is not dealing with the opposition, but total domination. The use of terror, which is the actual content of a totalitarian regime. And so the secret police is about terror. And the way it works is that it replaces what we would normally think of as the subjective enemy, an enemy who's actually opposed to the regime with what is called the objective enemy. The objective enemy is an enemy that has based on and defined by the regime, not by what the enemy does. And it's thus by who they are as a Jew or a gypsy or a communist or whatever. And so on page 423 to 424, she defines the objective enemy as, quote, is defined by the policy of the government and not by his own desire to overthrow it. He is never an individual whose dangerous thoughts must be provoked or whose past justifies suspicion, but a, quote, carrier of tendencies, unquote, like the carrier of a disease. And so the objective enemy is someone who is simply defined by the regime and the government as uh, an enemy not because of what he thinks or does, but because of who he is. On 424, she writes, quote, Practically speaking, the totalitarian, the totalitarian ruler proceeds like a man who persistently insults another man until everybody knows that the latter is his enemy, so that he can, with some plausibility, go and kill him in self-defense. If you keep saying... These people are my enemy. The Jews are my enemy. <coughs> or the media is my enemy. Or these are the enemies of the people. If you keep saying it, eventually when you go and kill them, you say, I kill them because they're the enemy. And this is the way that you create 
objective enemies uh, that have nothing in common with people who actually are your enemy. And uh, the secret police is the method by which this is done. Uh, and what they prove is that it's possible uh, to basically create crimes, uh, to create crimes based on possibility rather than the fact that they've actually been committed. And so on 427, she writes, totalitarianism's central assumption that everything is possible thus leads through consistent elimination of all factual restraints to the absurd and terrible consequence that every crime the rulers can conceive of must be punished regardless of whether or not it has been committed. So if we can conceive of treason or conceive of Jewish treason, Jews must be punished even if there was no Jewish treason, and yet we can conceive of it. And so she then, on 432 forward, describes what she calls the stages of arbitrariness of the rule of a secret police, the terror of a secret police. And in the first stage, the victims are the people who are actually in opposition. They're subjective enemies in a way. In the second stage, we persecute objective enemies, the Poles, the Jews, the sick, and anyone who can be seen as a possible danger to the state. Now, you still have to argue that the Poles or the Jews or the sick are a danger to the state, and so this can't be completely arbitrary. Uh, and this goes back to the chapters earlier in the book on anti-Semitism, because what she wants to argue here is that there was a reason they chose the Jews. Not that the Jews are guilty or the Jews deserve to be chosen, uh, but that they had to basically make an argument and there had to be a reason given. And RN offers some of those reasons. She doesn't believe they're right, but she says that they have to be convincing or persuasive in some way. But then only in the third stage of arbitrariness does that reason even drop out and in this final stage, she says the victims are totally random. They are declared unfit to live without even being accused of a crime. You can just go and arrest anybody. Uh, and it's sort of a Kafkaesque idea. And there's no, uh, you don't even have to charge them with a crime. They're just Jews. And this, as she says on page 433, this results in, quote, consistent arbitrariness that negates human freedom. And that's uh, what the role of terror does in, uh, in a, a totalitarian society. Part three is on total domination. And as I said in the first edition of the book, this was in fact the final chapter, uh, final section of the final chapter. And it ends with a bang. Uh, and it's an attempt to really describe the utter uh, desolation of totalitarian domination, the rendering superfluous of an entire people. And the way it does this is it adds to the so-called state and the secret police, a third and truly uniquely totalitarian uh, approach, which is the extermination and concentration camps, which she calls the laboratories of totalitarianism. And the camps really were for Arendt the most disgusting, horrific, unbelievable most difficult to believe. She describes in other places how um, so much of what totalitarianism did was analogous to other forms of government, tyranny, despotism, etc. But the camps, she describes how when she first learned about the camps, the fact that they were places where they just brought innocent people objective enemies, but who had done nothing wrong and killed them in mass bureaucratic actions. That to her was 
almost was at first unbelievable. And um, and the camps really are for her the uh, uniquely uh, terroristic aspect of totalitarian rule. And so she says in a very famous line on 439 to 40, quote, There is a great temptation to explain away the intrinsically incredible by means of rationalizations. In each one of us there lurks such a liberal, wheedling us with the voice of common sense. Um, and this is, in a sense, her warning to herself, because, as she said, she had trouble believing that something like the camps could actually exist when she first learned about them. And we have to be able to face facts, face reality. And uh, it's easy when we're confronted with increasingly uh, incredible means to rationalize them, to say, oh, it must be like this. It must be that, not be that bad. And we have to now be prepared to realize that anything can happen, including the worst. Uh, and she says in this very moving couple of pages on 441 to 442 that we need to dwell on the horrors of the Holocaust to understand we can't turn away. Um, but she then says something which is incredible, which is that dwelling on the horrors actually cannot help us. It won't actually lead us to resist totalitarianism. Um, experience of things, dwelling on these horrors, uh, in the end, we, 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 we wash it away. We, we turn it into... We don't let it really touch us. And there's the, 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 the great insight into this is, is Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, essay on experience where he talks about his son and he says, it does not touch me. And what he's saying is that we try and think and we try and have these experiences, but in some way we don't let the experiences really move us. We, we always have ways of resisting them. And Arendt is saying the same thing about the camps. Simply dwelling on them will not prevent us from allowing it to happen again. She says the only thing that can truly, in a sense, um, inoculate us uh, against a future arising of totalitarian camps is horror, fear. The real fear or horror of the camp um, needs to be... Uh, needs to be uh, uh, habituated in us. And thus the fear of camps and the utter terror that they might return um, means that for us today, the only real yardstick to judge events is whether they will serve and lead to totalitarian domination or not. Uh, this is what she writes on page 442, and it's worth just taking a look at. She says, Thus the fear of concentration camps and the resulting insight into the nature of total domination might serve to invalidate all obsolete political differentiations from right to left and to introduce beside and above them the politically most important yardstick for judging events in our time. Namely, whether they serve totalitarian domination or not. And it's this fearful imagination which leads us to understand that as the question. Um, how do the camps come about? How is it that we lead to totalitarian domination and the rise of concentration and extermination camps. And she says, she describes this on pages 446 through 457. And she describes a three-step process in which uh, we prepare living corpses. Now, obviously, living corpses are, on the one hand, the people in the concentration camps, but they're also the people who can run them and can be brought into them. 
the first step in the preparation of the living corpses is the killing of the judicial person, the putting of certain people outside of the law, uh, the forcing of the world to recognize lawless peoples, refugees, Jews, stateless people, uh, that we can not only create laws, but we can take laws away and rights away. Uh, and thus the concentration camps are outside of the traditional penal system. And uh, they include innocence in them. And it's actually the innocence, she says on page 449, who are the most suitable for thorough experimentation in disenfranchisement and destruction of the juridical person. In a sense, she continues on porch 451, the aim of an arbitrary system is to destroy the civil rights of the whole population who ultimately become just as outlawed in their own country as the stateless and the homeless. And so that's the first, you take away the idea that people have rights that and you assume and you assert that anyone can be deprived of their rights. That's the first step. The second step she calls the killing of the moral person. You make martyrdom impossible, she writes on page 451. And how do you do that? You make these people disappear. Because martyrdom requires that people are seen, that their deaths are seen. Remember back uh in chapter 9, she says that the truly, only truly human right is to live in a polis, to live in a political community, and thus to be able to act and speak in ways that matters, including die in ways that matter. And here, uh, by hiding people in these holes of oblivion, in these camps, you take away the right even to die well. And that kills the moral person, because the truly moral act you can do in the face of terror is die, but die meaningfully, and you take it away. And then the third step in the production of living corpses is that you kill the individual person. And once the moral person dies, uh, and you don't have the right to a good death, death, the only thing that separates man from being a living corpse, she says, is a kind of sterile form of individuality, a kind of dignity or honor or decency. Uh, if you've ever read, uh, for example, Darkness at Noon, the, the, the novel by Arthur Kessler, Rubishoff, the prisoner who's a communist, um, is arrested and they want him to recant as in a show trial. And he refuses and refuses and refuses for a long time. And why does he refuse, they keep asking. And it's a matter of dignity. It's his individuality, his honor. And his eye tooth keeps hurting. That's sort of the, the eye, the grammatical eye. The gram and, and, and they call it the grammatical fiction because it doesn't exist. Uh, and yet that's what's left of the individual. And yet the camp, the totalitarian camps, she says, are an assault on human decency and individualism. In the mass of bodies, in the starvation, in the turning everyone into skeletons, um, we destroy any spontaneity. We all act the same. We want food. We're desperate. We cheat. We lie. Dignity and decency disappear. And we turn the camp inmates she says, into ghastly marionettes with human faces which all behave like the dog in Pavlov's experiments. And this absolute submission to our bodies is the murder of the individual person. And these three murders, the murder of the moral person, the annihilation of the juridical person, and the destruction of the individual in the individual are almost always successful in a camp environment, she says on page 455. And what it does is it makes the people in the camps superfluous. It destroys man, the dignity of man. Now, 
This is only in the camp. But the camps, as she understands them, are laboratories that show us how to do it in society itself. And so the camps become the first step. And if you can do it in the camp, you can extend that lesson out. Um, and this is what totalitarianism wants. The lust for the destruction of human dignity. The lust for uh, power and the destruction of human dignity. And so on page 457, as she begins to end this chapter, she writes at the bottom... Ideologies are harmless, uncritical, and arbitrary opinions only as long as they are not believed in seriously. Once their claim to total validity is taken literally, they become the nuclei of a logical system, of logical systems, in which, as in the systems of paranoiacs, everything follows comprehensibly and even compulsorily once the first premise is accepted. And this idea of logic, the logicality of ideologies, which traps you, um, is going to become a core uh, uh, idea in the last chapter, chapter 13, on ideology and terror. It's the demand for this fictional consistency over and against well-being or uh, the normal aspects of power. What a totalitarian system wants is the fictional consistency and the lust for that consistency. And the result, and we'll end here, as she writes at the very end on 459, the danger of the corpse factories, these camps, and the holes of oblivion where you go to disappear, is that today with populations and homelessness everywhere on the increase, masses of people are continuously rendered superfluous if we continue to think of our world in utilitarian terms. Refugees, masses of people at the lower end of the economic spectrum are economically superfluous. Uh, Increasingly, with automation and artificial intelligence, ever more people in our world will be economically and, to a certain extent, politically superfluous. Political, social, and economic events everywhere, she continues, are in silent conspiracy with totalitarian instruments devised for making men superfluous. The implied temptation is well understood by the utilitarian common sense of the masses, who in most countries are too desperate to retain much fear of death. The Nazis and the Bolsheviks can be sure that their factories of annihilation, which demonstrate the swiftest solution to the problem of overpopulation, of economically superfluous and socially rootless human masses, are as much of an attraction as a warning. Totalitarian solutions may well survive the fall of totalitarian regimes in the form of strong temptations which will come up whenever it seems impossible to alleviate political, social, or economic misery in a manner worthy of man. As we increase the number of superfluous people, it's going to be ever more difficult to uh, um, serve these people. Yeah, in times of economic growth, when we're flush, giving them welfare, giving them services will be easy. But in times of catastrophe, in times of depression, there will be a question what to do with these superfluous people. And what Arendt says is totalitarian solutions like the camps, concentration and extermination, may actually serve as attractions and not as warnings.
and that is something we need to confront. So that is her description of totalitarianism and power. Look forward to discussing it with you. Thank you very much.